Hollywood Community Church. Uh, always a blessing to be here. This is a very, very beautiful place to, to preach and to share the Word of God. And, and I am delighted to have the opportunity to deal with the topic that we're dealing with this morning. Uh, but it's, some, it's somewhat of a challenge for me because not only is it a subject that uh, I, I love myself, but it's one that I'm extremely passionate about, and especially passionate about being able to teach it, and that is the subject of prayer. So I have a mounting task in front of me today. Uh, I'm, I'm also excited that I have the privilege of serving with Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian is not only a good pastor, but he's also my good friend. Uh, and those of you who've been knowing me long enough to know that my friends, they get picked on all the time. And, and, and I can't tell you, if it wasn't for the fact that I was so time limited this morning, there's so many jokes that come to my mind right now. That, that this man would give me the privilege as my friend to stand in his pulpit, all the jokes I could tell. But I love Pastor Brian. He's such an incredible guy. Uh, I can count on one hand the number of pastors I've had the opportunity to work with uh, that have both feet in ministry and truly get the concept of what a pastor is all about. One of the most sincere people that I know, and I'm very privileged and honored to be able to serve God alongside him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Dealing with the subject of prayer, I have to say, first of all, one of the things we got to do is we got to stop making prayer out to be something unusual. Prayer should be common. Prayer should be something that is a part of our culture. It shouldn't be something that we have to warm ourselves up to. It shouldn't have to be something that we have to niche out special things to do for. Prayer should be common to us. Because we are citizens of God's kingdom, we have to make sure that prayer it's common. It shouldn't be something that is ridiculously unusual. It shouldn't be something that seems magical. But prayer should be common to all of us because it should be a natural part of our culture. But, but the thing you'll find in most churches is that prayer services tend to be one of the least attended services of all. And there's some reasoning behind that. If we're honest with ourselves, a lot of people don't pray because they don't feel like prayer really and truly works. I disagree. I think effective prayer works 100% of the time. I don't think God ever fails us. I don't think God ever withholds anything from us. I think prayer works 100% of the time. Other people may pray because they say, I don't have time to pray. We're so busy, we're so caught up in our lives and so caught up in our routines that, that we feel like we, we don't have the time to sit still and pray. I also disagree with that because by experience I have learned that prayer saves me time. Prayer keeps me from getting my priorities out of order. Prayer keeps me from getting in things I shouldn't be getting into. Prayer teaches me where to put my time, my talents, and my resources. And in effect, I'm actually able to save time. And I believe it was Martin Luther that said, I have so much to do today that I need to spend an extra hour in prayer. We got to do it. And I'm going to tell you something. We, we're going to get real this morning. Y'all got a country boy standing up here in front of you. I don't, I don't know any other way to do it. I, I can't make it cute. I can't make it fancy. I just have to do it the way I do it. And I'm going to tell you something. The, these little 15-minute devotions we do to give God some time in the morning, that, that's for babies. We've got to get to the point where we're making prayer a priority in our lives so that we can honor God and glorify his kingdom here on earth the way that we ought to do it. Those 15-minute devotions, that's, that's not enough. It's not going to get you there. We've got to be able to give God time, and we've got to be able to give God our lives. But the main thing I want to make sure you understand today is that prayer works. we just got to learn how to do it right. So here's the big picture. Three things I want you to walk away with today. I want us to be able to answer these three questions. First of all, what is prayer? We've got to make sure that we're speaking the same language. We've got to make sure that we are... Uh, talking the same terms. I want to make sure that we have an operational definition of what prayer is. Secondly, why pray? If God already knows what we need, if, if, if he knows before we ask, if, if everything is already available to us, why pray? And then thirdly, how do we pray? Now, if any of you have sat in any of my, my life groups or any of my teachings where I have opportunity to teach the kingdom of God, you know I always take the scenic route to explain anything. 
When, when you come to Kingdom Keys Life Group, uh, you, you notice we take our time. Sometimes we're still sitting in our life group and they'll turn the lights off on us because we want to make sure we get everything from A to Z. So we're going to take a scenic route to answering those questions this morning. You know, I could get up here and I can tell you in 10 to 15 minutes how to pray. But if we don't understand the what and the why, the how won't make a difference. You'll just be imitating. You'll just be filling in a formula. But we want to make sure we understand the what and the why so that we can really have power when we pray. That makes sense? That makes sense? Yes. I, I, look, I'm a teacher and I'm from the South. You got to talk to me. <laughs> I, need, I need to know that you're there and that you're listening. All right. So let's go to the word first. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. The Bible says this. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, mm. your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Father, thank you for your word. Will you make it clear this morning? Will you make it undeniable this morning? Father, I pray that as the preacher of your word, you would be sufficient where I'm insufficient, that you would be able where I'm unable, that your strength will be made perfect in my weaknesses. I pray that you'll hold back my human frailties and allow your word and your glory to come forth. We give you glory, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In this immediate context of the scripture, because before we actually get to the scripture itself, we want to back up again and take that scenic route. So let's start by taking a look at the immediate context of this scripture, what's been really going on. The, the, the church as a whole, every speaker that's been coming to the past several months, have been handling different portions of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And there's a context to it all. If we back up just a little bit further, in, in fact, when you read your Bibles, make sure that you're aware of, that, that's what they call the pericopes in your Bible. Those are the different section headings that breaks up the passage and makes it easier for you to read. But there are times when you got to take the pericopes and remove them out of the way so that you don't discontinue the context of what's going on in the Scripture. So if we take this Sermon on the Mount and we back up just a little bit before and take a look at what was going on before Jesus actually began to teach the Sermon on the Mount, we see some interesting things that are unfolding in the kingdom of God on earth. One of the first things we see is that John the Baptist's ministry had just ended. And it ended with him being arrested and put in jail. Now that's important because John the Baptist, the Bible says, was the one who was to pave the way for Jesus to come. He was the forerunner of Christ. That's kingdom, by the way. Anytime a king is coming to a country, there's always people who go ahead of him. They tell the people to fix up buildings, to clean up the streets, to make their houses look a certain way, to do all these things to prepare the way for the king coming. So the purpose of John the Baptist was to prepare the way for the king. Now, John's ministry had ended with his arrest. And the Bible says that from that time, Jesus began to, to, peep, to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that was the same thing that, that John the Baptist himself taught. So Jesus picked up where John left off, which was teaching the kingdom. So John's ministry ended, Jesus' ministry had begun, and Jesus began his ministry by teaching the kingdom. In fact, if you look real closely, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, I don't have this up on the screen, 
it, when you look real closely, the, the Bible specifically says that Jesus was going around from city to city to city to city, and he was preaching a very specific message. And that very specific message that Jesus was teaching was the gospel of the kingdom. We can't read our Bible so fast that we miss that. That's important. Because everything we talk about today when we talk about prayer makes no sense unless you understand the kingdom. The Bible makes no sense unless you understand the kingdom. The whole ministry of Jesus was about the kingdom. The whole entire Bible is about the kingdom. I can prove it to you. Try me. I can prove it to you. From beginning to end, the Bible is about the kingdom. So if this is important to God in the Bible, if this was important to the ministry of Jesus, then it has to be important to me. I got to get this. Jesus was going about and he was teaching the kingdom. And what Matthew does in this scripture that we're about to read, what Matthew does is he slows down the account of Jesus' life and he hits the slow motion button and he gives us a detailed perspective of what Jesus was going about teaching. Before it was just summarizing. He went here and he taught the kingdom. He went here and he taught the kingdom. But what Matthew did is he gave us some details. Let me show you what he was teaching when he was going from city to city. Now, that's not to say that Jesus was teaching the same message over and over again, but it's to give us an idea of what he was talking about. Jesus was going around, and he was flipping the script. All these years, they heard all of these concepts from one particular perspective. But when Jesus came along, he taught original truth. And he taught it so well that they made statements such as, he does not teach like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but he teaches as one having authority. There was power in what Jesus taught. And the power behind Jesus' Jesus' message was so strong that it moved the whole entire nation. And the only thing Jesus did was he took us back to God's original purpose. When you teach the kingdom, that's all you're really doing. You're taking everything back to how God originally planned for it to be. So now we're at the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is reteaching God's original plan, God's original purpose, God's original intent, God's original will. He taught the truth. Truth, properly defined, is just original information. He took them back to how it was supposed to be. You take man's traditions out of the way, put God's original plans back in, and you got truth. Amen? So Jesus was teaching the kingdom. And I could go on and on and on revealing that in the scripture. But my point is, the context here. It's the kingdom. We got to get the kingdom. We got to make sure we understand that, and then we can get there. And then he moves up to this point that we call prayer, where he began to teach his disciples how to pray. In fact, if you look at parallel scripture, you find that his disciples had even asked him a question. They say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Jesus, you pray so differently. You pray so powerfully. You get so much result with your prayer. Will you teach us how to pray? They were used to praying in the synagogue. A lot of times they would take written prayers and they would recite those written prayers, but but they noticed something different about Jesus. Jesus Jesus had a personal aspect to prayer. He he didn't pray like other people pray. So, Lord, teach us how to pray. And that's how we get to this point. So let's begin by defining what prayer is. What is prayer? We need a working definition because there's a religious concept of prayer but then that's God's original kingdom concept of prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is an expression of man's relationship to God that results in alignment with God's heart, God's will, and God's image. Get this. It is an execution of heaven's, earthly, of heaven's authority in an earthly domain. I ruined y'all's scripture up there on the screen. I apologize for that. (laughs) Let me reread that. Prayer is an expression of man's relationship to God that results in alignment with God's heart, God's will, 
and God's image. It is an execution of heaven's authority in an earthly domain. I'm, I'm going I'm to give you a disclaimer right up front. I don't think I'm going to finish today. There's just not enough time for me to teach this with quality and in a way God has put it on my heart to do it. So be patient with me, all right? Let's, let's get to my point real quickly. Why do we define it that way, especially that last part of it? It is an execution of heaven's authority in an earthly domain. I'm excited, y'all. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a happy man right now. <laughs> Woo. Why do we define it that way? Let's, let's work backwards. Let's take the long way around. Let, let me start by asking you a question. How many of you say or would, would agree that God is in control on the earth? Let me see your hand. God is in control on the earth. All right, I'm going to ask you a second question. How many of you believe that the Bible is without error? It contains no mistakes whatsoever. It is the perfect revealed word of God. Now, just for clarity's sake, I want to ask that one more time. Now, how many of you believe that God is in control on the earth? How many of you believe that God's word is without error? How many of you believe that there might be a trick behind that question? <laughs> now, notice, I am not asking you about the sovereignty of God. God is absolutely sovereign, absolutely sovereign. But I'm asking you about his control on the earth. All right, now, most of you said, by showing of your hand, it's too late to change your mind, <laughs> that you believe that God is in control on the earth. See, that's the first problem with prayer. That's the first problem with prayer is that our mindset is misaligned. Now, let's go to the Bible that you said was without error. You've already agreed that you can't change your mind. Look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. The Bible says this, Then God said, now who said it? God. Not Mike, not Brian Burkholder, not Moses, not anybody else. But God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them, everybody say them, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, if, if God is in control, why do we have war? Why do we have violence? Why do we have hatred? Why do we have racism? Why do we have all of these problems if God is in control? I believe God can do a better job than that. The problem is not that God is not in control. The problem is that God wants to control through you. It's not God that's out of order. We are out of order. B because here's what we do. We run into challenges, and the very first thing we say is, God, fix this. God says, no, I want you to fix this. God says, I want to work through you. If I do it for you, you would never understand your place on this earth. If I do it for you, you would never understand my power. If I do it for you, you would never understand what I can do through you. We're giving it back to him, and God is saying, no, I want you to do it. But we say, no, God, you fix it. We got problems in Haiti. We can say, God, fix Haiti. Are we can go in the spirit and power of Almighty God and fix it for the influence of his kingdom and his glory. The first problem in prayer is that we have to understand that man was created to influence the earth with God's kingdom. We were created to do it. He designed us to function that way. So when we don't pray, and when we don't pray effectively, we are short-circuiting our ability to influence the earth with God's kingdom. He wants to work through you. But when you don't pray, you are limiting what you're able to do for God on the earth. So the first reason why I'm have to pray is because we were designed to influence the earth, and we cannot influence the earth without prayer. Jesus said, always pray. And I think there's so much stuff I can share there, but i got to keep moving. Jesus said, always pray. 
and not faint. There's a reason why Jesus said that. Paul came along and he said the same thing. He said, pray without ceasing. Pray all the time. Pray, 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 pray. You have to pray. Why? Because that is your source of saying, connect it with God and influence the earth with his kingdom. Got to keep moving. Second thing we have to understand is that man was created to reflect the image and the likeness of God. You were created to reflect the image and the likeness of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. Now, now do you realize that by God making that statement, it makes him more real than you? <laughs> Let that sink in for a second. By God making that statement, it makes him more real than you. Let me show you what I mean. It won't take me but a second. This is a mirror, and a mirror is designed to do what? Reflect, Reflect an image. Now, I am standing here. This is me. This is me. My image is in the mirror. Which is more real? Me or my image? I'm more real, right? Listen, th there's God, and then there's his image, which is you. If you are his image, then he is more real than you. So the whole point of prayer is to make that image so real that you cannot tell the difference between the image and the object. One of the purposes of prayer is that we commune with God so much that they can no longer tell the difference between you and the God that is in you. This is how Jesus could make statements like when they asked Jesus, show us the Father. Jesus could say, if you've seen me, <laughs> you've seen the Father because I represent his image so well that there's no difference between me and my Father. How did he do it? The Bible says he would get up oftentimes early and go off and pray long before sunrise, time when people were still dreaming. Jesus was up seeking the Father. Let me encourage you while I got time. Get up early in the morning for prayer. The manna failed in the morning. If you didn't get up and get the manna, you, would, you missed all of your meals for that day. David figured it out. David said, early in the morning will I seek your face. You got to be excited about God. And when you get the power of prayer, you won't even need an alarm clock. It's no different than when your parents told you, we're going to Disney World today. You were up the night before. <laughs> so excited. Christmas night, you can't sleep because you're so excited. David said, I'm so excited. I got to get up early in the morning. I'm so ready to meet my God. I got to do this. And the more I do that, the more I begin to reflect his image. So why pray? Because we were designed to commune with our Father so that we can properly reflect his image. Thirdly, man was created to relate to God and to work with him. Everybody say with. So why pray? Because if I'm supposed to be working with God, I don't know what God is doing unless I pray. I don't know what God is saying unless I pray. I don't know what God is up to unless I pray. I'm designed to work with him. I'll give you an illustration. Think about before sin and after sin. Before Adam sinned, there was a perfect relationship between him and God. That was a moment the Bible describes where God wanted Adam to name the animals. God was in heaven, Adam was on earth. The Bible says this, that, that was a relationship. God brought the animals, and Adam did what? Named them. And the Bible says something very specific at that point. It says, God stopped to see what Adam would name the animals. 
And whatever he named them, that was its name. That was such a perfect relationship that Adam knew what was on God's mind. Adam knew what God would accept. They were in constant communion so well that Adam didn't have to go and light up a whole bunch of candles and chant all kind of rituals and so He didn't have to do all of that stuff to get worked up. But when they sinned, something different happened. Something different happened. This time, when God was ready to commune with Adam, he couldn't find him. Adam had tried to cover himself and hide behind trees or bushes or whatever he was hiding behind. He tried to hide from God. And God asked the question, Adam, where are you? What have you done? How did you mess this up? Why? Some of the reasons why we don't pray because we're running from God. You have sin in your life that you don't want to own up to. You have things that you're doing that are hurting that communion, that are messing up that relationship. And you think you can hide from God by not communicating. But see, that's from a religious perspective. From a kingdom perspective, God is always looking for you. He gets up looking for you. He seeks after you. He wants you. And you're not going to hide. From Jonah tried it. It doesn't work. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Listen, this is a point where I've got to be honest with you. Because there's a grace message that's going around that teaches you to cover your sin with grace. And in the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad to go home and beat yourself over the head. All I'm saying is, when you sin, don't waddle in your mess. Go to God. Let him fix it. Let him get it right. We're all human. We all mess up. We all fail sometimes. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. That includes me. I fall short all the time. But one thing I have mastered is the art of getting up and starting over. When you don't go to God in prayer, it leads to an attitude of self-sufficiency. Because you're supposed to be working with him, not just for him. When you think you only work for God, you're going to eventually become self-sufficient or think you're self-sufficient. When you become self-sufficient, you're going to stop praying. When you stop praying, you're going to limit your power on the earth because heaven wants to work through you. Let's move forward. Here's another thing. Man's purpose is to do the will of the Father. This point is so important and so critical, but yet it's so clear. I'm just going to read one scripture. That's it. I got about 10 or 15 different ways I can prove this to you, but I'm just going to read one scripture. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Just one scripture. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus was so clear. He said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does, read it. Let me tell you something, and I'm saying this with every bit of love I can muster. Your church membership is not enough to get you into the kingdom of heaven. The synagogue was full of hypocrites. The Jewish community was full of hypocrites. This church can be full of... I got in ministry 15 years ago. 15 years ago, I got in ministry. My, my very first sermon, the very first sermon I preached, the very first sermon I preached, 
It had a title. It was called Pharisees. Dressed up on the outside, messed up on the inside. I, I was young. Trust, I, I, was, I was on fire. I was out of my mind with ambition. But that's what I talked about. It doesn't matter. What truly identifies you is you doing the will of a king. That's why we've got to understand how a kingdom works. In a kingdom, you don't do what you want to do. You don't do things your way. You don't make up your own laws, your own decrees, your own commandments. You don't make up your own set of righteous standards. You don't do that in a kingdom. It doesn't work. A kingdom is all about the king. And that word will is so important. I got to ingrain this in our minds. A will is not a religious word that we just throw around. But in a kingdom, a will is a legal term that refers to the desires of the king. So Jesus is saying... It's not those who call me Lord that will enter into my Father's kingdom, but it's those who do his desires. And there's only one way I can discover the will of God. I got to be still. I got to get along with him in prayer. I got to hear his voice. And then we can say stuff like Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. I only say what I hear my father say. The son can only do according to what the father does. And the father shows him everything that he does. You don't get that with a 15-minute devotion in the morning. (laughs) You get that from a lifetime spent seeking something. From a lifetime of searching after him from a lifetime of going after God again and again and again. A righteous man falls seven times, but he's going to get back up. They say he didn't fall. Righteous people fall. Listen, crooked people don't fall. They're already there. Listen, we've got to get over our pride we got to get past our self-righteousness, realize you're nothing but a bag of sin. Get over yourself. You messed up. Fix it. Get it right. Time is too short. Our mission is too important. God died for you while you were still a sinner. He didn't say, get it right, then I'll die for you. Get it right. My last point before I move into the scripture. I'm getting to the word. If, if I don't get to this scripture, Pastor Brian is going to fire me. I'm telling you. I, I know this man. <laughs> oh, man, I want to joke so bad, but I don't have time. Oh. Here's my final point before I move into the scripture. Man was designed to live in an atmosphere of God's presence. Listen to every single word of that point. You are specifically designed to live in an atmosphere of God's presence. Just like a fish was designed to live where? In water. And and that's one thing I cannot get about God's creation. The animal kingdom has figured it out. When you take a fish out of water, what's the first thing he starts doing? Flopping around. I got to get back to water. I got to get back to water. I got to get back to water. This is not my environment. I do not belong here. I got to get back to the water. You were designed to live in an atmosphere of God's presence. Here's how I can prove it to you. When God formed Adam, wouldn't you think that God would want him to put him in the ideal position for success, right or wrong. The Bible says that when God formed Adam, he put him in a unique place. We call it Eden. 
And the Bible says that God took the man whom he had formed and placed him in the Garden of Eden. And when Adam was in that garden, the Bible doesn't specify how long he was there. But when he was in that garden, every single thing worked the way it was supposed to work. Everything worked and functioned at a pristine state. Exactly how it was supposed to. But you take him out of that environment, and the first thing God says, Adam, guess what? Now that you're not in this environment anymore, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. Work wasn't the curse. The problem was that now, Adam, because you're no longer in my presence, you're going to have to work excessively hard to make things happen. You're going to have to toil by the sweat of your brow. Eden is not a geographical location. Eden was simply a spot on earth where God uniquely communed with man. And let me tell you something about God's presence and the presence of a righteous king. No unrighteousness can be tolerated in the presence of our king. Jesus said it this way. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. <laughs> when Adam sinned, they put angels around the place to keep him from going back in there. You cannot survive in unrighteousness in the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. Another sermon for another day. But that's why we have to pray. Because we belong in that atmosphere. When you're not praying, you're not in that atmosphere. When you're not in that atmosphere, you're going to die. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Let's get to the word. Because I could go all day like that. Now that we know what prayer is and why we have to pray, the how becomes simple. The how becomes so much more simple. Because here's the point that Jesus was saying. If we go back to Matthew chapter 6, 5 through 8, I'm going to read this quickly. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your secret room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases that the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus was very clear on this. His point that he was trying to make is that you have to recognize the issues of the heart. The two people he described, the hypocrites and the Gentiles, had two problems. One was after vain glory. The other one was using vain repetition. It's all about vanity, vanity, vanity. It was all vain. It was all pointless. Their motives were wrong, and they were using prayer in the wrong way. One of them wanted to be seen. He would stand on the, the street corners, which would give him maximum exposure, maximum exposure. He wanted to be seen as pious as religious, as holy. The other one didn't recognize who he was talking to. And he thought that he could somehow manipulate this God and get him to do what he wanted him to do. God, God does not work that way. I don't know who described it that way, but somebody said that he's an unmoved mover. When you pray, you don't move God. God moves you. So their problem was that their prayers were in vain. In other words, we've got to deal with the heart issues when we pray. And there are so many different types of heart issues. This first man had a heart issue where he just wanted to be recognized by people. Self-righteousness. The other man had a heart issue because his heart was in the wrong place. He, he didn't have God in his heart. He didn't understand who he was talking to. Heart problems. We've got to deal with the idols in our heart when we go to God. And let me tell you something. An idol is anything in your heart that's bigger than Jesus. When you go to God in prayer, you have to remove the idols from your heart. Because if you don't, you're going to answer your own prayer. Because God is going to answer you. But your answer is going to be misled by the real thing that you're listening to, which is yourself. 
The Bible describes it as leaning, it, leaning onto your own understanding. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall do what? Direct your paths. So remove idols from the heart. Deal with the heart issues. Recognize the heart problems. And, and recognize the issues of the heart. The heart is the key to effective prayer. The heart is the seat of our faith, the framework of our thoughts, and the source of our motives. Vanity, which leads to idolatry, must be removed from the heart. Then he said this, pray then like this. Instead of praying like the hypocrites, instead of praying like the Gentiles who don't know God, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This verse is packed with power. We could unfold it for a year. But here's the simple truth. Here's the simple truth. Jesus is saying, remember the relationship. Remember who you're talking to. When we call him our father, a father is a source. A father is a protector. A father is a leader. Recognize who he is. Remember that relationship. Remember that God is seated in heaven and you are seated on earth. Can I show you something real quick? I'm running out of time, but I, I got to show you this because it changed my life when it came to prayer. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. This, this changed my life. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2 said this, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. And it tells you why. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. How often do we come to God with our list? And we get our list from beginning to the end, and we're done. That's not effective. Real prayer is being still and listening to him because all the stuff that's on your prayer list, he already knows about it. And that doesn't mean don't pray what's on your list. There's a point where Jesus indicates we got to pray for things. But that can't be the high priority. The first priority has to be an understanding of my relationship with the one that I'm talking to. And just as the heavens are above the earth, he says to us, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. Since God knows so much better than I do, I need to be listening and letting him talk. But here's what happens. When we get still before God, all of our issues start to bubble up. And we don't like that. I start thinking about things I shouldn't be thinking about. I start realizing things I don't want to be realizing. Deal with it. Confront it. Lay it at the cross. But listen to what he has to say about that sick person on your prayer list. Listen to what he has to say about your financial situation. Their keys, their wisdom, their tools he can use to help you get out of your circumstance. Look at the person next to you and say, neighbor... Do you have any idea how much wisdom God has available to get you out of where you are? Hallelujah. <laughs> Remember the relationship. Remember the relationship. And then he said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, your kingdom come. Your will, that is again, that is again. Look at what Jesus is praying for. Your kingdom come. <laughs> Your will be.
be done on earth as it already is in heaven. See, our purpose on earth is to influence the earth so much and impact it so much with the culture of God's kingdom that earth begins to look like heaven. <clears throat> That's so powerful, and I'm so passionate about it, it's best if I move on. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus said it himself. But seek first. The word first indicates priority and importance. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the things on your prayer list will be added to you. The problem is we get it out of order. We're so focused on the things that we forget about the source of the thing. We get so focused on our needs and our desires that we lose sight of whom our needs and our desires should be aligned with. That's how kingdoms work. That's how they function. That's how they operate. So Jesus is saying, recall the priority in prayer. You have needs. But your needs are so easy for God to meet, it's low priority. Some of you need money. In the kingdom of God, money is so cheap, we use it for building materials. The Bible says that there is a street paved, hallelujah, building material. We walk on it. Amen. Your financial need is nothing for God. I'm sorry. I, I know it seems big to you, but remember, anything in your heart that's bigger than Jesus is an idol. That money has become your idol. Your marriage problems, your work situation, issues with children, no matter how close it is to you, it can never become more important than Jesus. A lot of times those things are either distractions from the enemy or they are the result of foolish mistakes we've made and we've just reaping what we're sowing. Get over it. That does not change the heart of the king. That stuff is easy for him. The Bible says that God can control the heart of a king. You think he can't control the heart of your child, the heart of your husband, the heart of your boss. <laughs> my God, my God. Let me move on. <laughs> Here's another thing Jesus said. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. See, there it is. Jesus recognizes that we have needs to pray for, the things we have to have in order to be able to accomplish God's work. He said, pray for those things. It's okay to ask for them. They just can't be the top priority. So request heaven's help. You can't get by without him. The Bible makes it clear. We can do nothing apart from him. So why do we ask? He already knows what we have need of. Jesus said that himself. Why do we ask? Here's how. In a kingdom, everything belongs to the king. If you are a kingdom citizen, none of your possessions are yours. If you are a kingdom citizen, your house is belongs to the king. Your car belongs to the king. Your money belongs to the king. You belong to the king. The Bible says you were bought with a price. When we ask in a kingdom, we recognize our dependence on the one who gave it. In, in, in my house, we, we have this way, this special way that we do grace at the table. We don't say the, the, the common boxed-in graces anymore, but we, we hold up our glasses and we give a toast to the king and we all hold them up and we say, to the king. Because we want to remember who is the source of the meal that we are about to eat. He provided it. 
He put it on the table. Not daddy, not us, but the king. And it all belongs to him. Asking requires faith. Faith is like currency in the kingdom of God. It's how you get what you want. It's how you buy what you need in a sense. No different than going to Walmart. You can't just go in Walmart and just grab something and walk out the door. It doesn't work that way. There has to be an exchange. In the kingdom of God, your faith is the currency of exchange, which is another reason why prayer oftentimes doesn't work. Jesus said if you just have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move and be thrown to the sea and it'll be moved. we got to have faith. Here, here brings us to another problem, which was deleted to my last point. The Bible says that faith works through love. See, in the kingdom of God, there are things you cannot get away with that you can get away with sitting in your home or sitting in church. So you thought you could get away gossiping about somebody behind their back, putting somebody down, hating people, hurting people. In the kingdom of God, it doesn't work that way. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get to my last point because if I don't, I'd be here all day. He made a statement. He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then he skips down. If you skip down, he says, because if you don't forgive others for their trespasses, neither will he forgive you. Just because it's at the end doesn't mean it's the least important. If there's a problem with your love, if you have a lack of forgiveness in your heart, if there's a sister, a brother in your kingdom that you have failed to make amends with, you got to deal with it. In religion, I can cover that stuff up. I can walk in here with a smile on my face in my three-piece suit, and I can cover it up and make it look good. But in prayer, my heart matters. I got to forgive. Doesn't matter how they respond to my desire to forgive. Doesn't matter how they respond to my desire to love them. What matters is that I do it. This is the royal law of the kingdom, according to the Bible. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus said this law is so important, he said that on this law hangs all the laws and the prophets. In other words, he's saying retain righteousness because if you get out of order with this law, you're going to lose righteousness. You're going to lose your right standing with us, me and my father. You have to retain righteousness. I'm way out of time. I can hear Pastor Brian's heart beating from over here. <laughs> my word, my word. But listen, you got to pass that test. Because when you talk about temptations and delivering us from evil, temptations can come in the temptation to fall out of love with somebody. Temptations can come in the so minute and simple ways that you can overlook it. Temptations are all over the place. And what Jesus is implying is, Father, not that we're, we're not going to be tempted. Jesus himself was tempted in all ways. Not we're not going to be, but what he said is, Father, show us those temptations. Help us to stay away from them. Help us to avoid them. Point them out to us. Stay in righteousness. So here's what I wanted you to take away from this. Prayer has to be normal for you. Just as much as you eat, sleep, and breathe, prayer has to be that important. Your priority in prayer has to be the heart and the mind of our God. So when you get up in the morning, God, what are you up to today? God, what's on your mind? God, what's on your heart? God, what are you doing? Because whatever you're doing, that's what I want to do. Thirdly, Prayer always 
works. The answer may not look the way you want it to. A lot of times that happens because you have an idol in your heart. You come to God with what you want. Instead of aligning those desires first to what he wants. And then praying according to what he reveals. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, so much for the love you share with us, for the way your mercy unfolds new and fresh day after day after day. Father, I pray that you'll revive prayer in our hearts. Help us to see the importance of calling upon your name, sitting in your presence, enjoying who you are. Help us to know you and know you like Christ knew you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. May it be multiplied a hundred times over. May your kingdom come. May your will be done as we give you glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.